In that mighty chorus, voices will so You know we gonna sing hallelujah. Sing By and by, God will be our sadness, pleasures will never. You know we gonna sing hallelujah. What joy when we get home. You know we gonna rest beneath We gonna rest beneath that cloudless Oh, in that land where saints never You know we gonna sing hallelujah Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Praising our Redeemer there beside the crystal spring. You know we're gonna sing hallelujah. We're gonna sing hallelujah, by and by. Oh, 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 what joy, oh, what joy. When we get home. you know we gonna rest beneath, we gonna rest beneath that cloudless oh in that land, in that land where saints never you know we gonna sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah come on now. Oh, what joy when we say amen. amen. If God has been good to you, say amen. amen. We're here to worship God this morning. If you would please bow with me as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, I stand before your people on this morning, in this service, to deliver your message. Though the words are mine and I've prepared this message from your scripture, I pray that this sermon, Father, is your message in its entirety. I pray, Father, that you bless and anoint this message in its delivery, 
its reception, and above all, its application in our lives. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. As every heart that agrees, say it, amen. amen. Good morning, South Lake. Good morning. How y'all doing? Y'all know South Lake is one of my favorite places to be. I love being here. There are so many people that I have love and affection for, so many people that have been vital in my life in this congregation. It's just a blessing to be here. I want to thank the elders and the leaders of this congregation for giving me this opportunity. I certainly want to thank your wonderful minister, Brother Taylor, uh, for giving me a moment to share with you this morning. It is always a blessing to be here. South Lake is a great congregation. I didn't hear enough amen. South Lake is a great congregation. Amen. Amen. You are great because you love God. You are great because God is the center of everything you do here. You are great because you have good Christian men leading this church. Amen. That doesn't happen everywhere. You are great because you have a great man of God that God has blessed you with to teach and to preach and help all of us grow into God. I sat in Vernon's Bible class this morning uh, with the new converts, and I've known Vernon, as you know, for many years. And what I can tell you is that his passion for God burns as deeply today as it did the day I met him. You just hear it in his voice when he starts. He was taking us through 1 Kings chapter 12, which I've studied many times, but Vernon has a way of sharing God's word. When you got, you know how you binge watch a TV show when you get to the end of the episode, you're ready for the next one, and you sit there and you watch two, three. He got to the end of the lesson. I didn't want to come to worship. I'm like, Vernon, keep going. He broke down that story of Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and so well that anyone can understand. But what I need you to know is, it is a blessing to have a man of God that can divide God's word that way. Don't take for granted what God has blessed you with. Sometimes blessings happen, and we think that goes on everywhere. I'm here to tell you it does not. Not everybody can handle God's word that way. And so you should be grateful to God that he has blessed you with a leader that can take you there. Now, I know this Sunday is Youth Sunday, and those of you who have known me for a while know that youth are a passion, a lifelong passion for me. And I want to just share a few thoughts with you about the importance of youth ministry. I won't be long, and then I'll get to our message for this morning. The first thing I will tell you is that a healthy and growing church, one of the signs of a healthy and growing church, is a vibrant youth ministry. It is an important part of a church that is growing and touching folks. It also provides a consistent spiritual circle of influence in your child's life, both from the other members in the church and from the other youth that they bond with. When you are a young person trying to be a Christian, it seems oftentimes that nobody else in school, none of your other friends are trying to live that way. And what happens is when you build a culture of youth ministry here, it gives them a place where they can feel a part of something, where they can bond and connect to other youth who are at least trying at least trying to walk with God, right? And that's important because the one thing you don't want to be when you're a young person is what? Different. But here's the challenge. Being a child of God makes you different. So the one place they don't have to feel that way, the one place they should be able to be around other young folks and feel like they always fit in is right here. And you have to help build that culture in this church so that there's a place for them here That is a life-changing experience, and I've seen it so many times over the years. To do that, you have to have, as a church, commitment to youth ministry. It begins as a congregation. I know your leaders already commit to youth ministry. They know how valuable it is, but it also is the rest of us. Parents, I know our lives get busy. And I know that our kids get involved in a lot of things, which are good things to do, right? Recreation and sports and piano lessons and all that things. But if you call yourself a Christian parent, 
This cannot be last on your list. You cannot find time for everything else your child is involved in, but when there's a youth activity, you are nowhere to be found. Because whether you say it or not, your kids learn their priorities from you. And when you never bring them here for these activities, when you never participate in the youth ministry, what are you telling them? That this ain't all that important. Because here's the truth all of us grown folks know. You make time for what's important to you. I don't care how many hours in a day. If it's important to you, you find the time. Right? When that job is paying your bills, you going to get there. You don't ever wake up if you got bills to pay. Now, some of y'all might be rich. I don't know. If you got bills to pay, you don't never go, I ain't got time to go to work. You find the time, right? If there's some activity you enjoy that is important to you, you find the time for it. Kids see that. And so if you as a parent don't set that culture in your home, you're telling them by your actions that God is not the first thing in your life. The other thing you need to understand is whatever we don't have the time, commitment, and resources to provide for our youth, whatever it is that we somehow just can't do, the world can. I, tr I trust me and believe Satan's got a plan for our kids. He's got the resources. he got the money. He's got everything they need. So when we somehow can't figure it out, Satan says, that's okay. Y'all can't figure out how to take care of them kids? I can. Send them my way. I got all the resources they need. I got all the fun they can think of. And you have to think of it that way because this is a spiritual battle. You can't give our kids to Satan. Now, I've had parents over the years, and I know that all of us have to pay bills. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to get to my sermon in a minute, y'all. <laughs> Vernon got me started on youth ministry. I know we all have bills to pay, so I'm not unrealistic. But just like I told you about time, the same thing happens with our money. Of the years I've done youth ministry, I've had parents come up to me and tell me, I don't know if I can afford to go on that activity, and they child sitting there in $200 sneakers. <laughs> the same folks that say, uh, we can't find a way to go to this youth activity, you register your child for this for $300 and that. For when you want to do it, let's be honest with each other. When you want to do it, you find a way. And in a loving church like this, there are enough people. This is what I mean by it's a congregational thing. There are enough people that would chip in and help out. Now, I learned this from Vernon years ago. Over all the years, I've done youth ministry over 25 years. I have never left a child out of an activity because they didn't have enough money. God will bless you when you commit to him. Right? Oh, man, I don't know if we can afford to do that. You afford to do everything else. Right? You find a way. If it's important to you. A Youth ministry honors God and blesses everyone. It blesses children. It blesses families. It will bless congregations. It is what God would have us to do. So I want you, South Lake, to lean into your youth ministry effort. And even if you don't have a child in the youth ministry, I'm still talking to you. Right? You can find a way now. You can find a way to bless the youth ministry whether you work with kids or not. So I use my younger brother as an example all the time. Uh, his kids are, are college age and grown now. And all the years I was doing youth ministry, he would tell everybody, that's Tony. Because he didn't have enough patience to hardly deal with his own kids, <laughs> let alone deal with somebody else's, right? So I get it. We're all different. Some things work for some and not for others. But you can find a way to be supportive. You can sponsor a child. And the one thing you can always do is encourage them. When you see young folks at church, you need to say something. Because you never know when that encouraging word is just what they needed to hear in that moment. There have been so many times when someone has said something to me in my church family that they didn't know what I was going through at the moment, but the Holy Spirit did. And if you are encouraging to folks, you will bless somebody even when you don't know it. You'll encourage a young person that years later as an adult, they'll be still thinking about those words you shared with them when they were young. So please, lean into youth ministry and bless this church, our families, and our children. So this morning, we're going to spend a little time. About to get to my sermon now, y'all. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. I wanted to share what I hope will be an encouraging uh, message from God's word. And the title of this sermon, if I had to give it one, is 
built for this. Perseverance and faith in tough times. Perseverance grounded in faith will carry you through whatever life brings your way. All of us in here are old enough to know that this world seems to be getting crazier by the moment. When you watch what's going around us today, it seems like it never ends. It's simply one thing after another. And as if that wasn't enough, each of us goes through our own personal struggles as well. And that's what brings us to this passage in the book of James, the first chapter. Beginning at verse 2, the scripture reads in the NIV, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking for anything. Perseverance is defined as the continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. The action or condition of an instance of persevering, steadfastness, stick to it to this. That's what we're talking about here. In verses 2 and 3 in James chapter 1, the passage introduces us to some heavy ideas. Ideas that are hard for us to kind of wrap our heads and our hearts around. We like to think good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. After all, that's the way life should work. That's ingrained in us for some reason. We still think life is supposed to be fair. It's almost like some type of default setting. And when it comes to dealing with life, the truth is that isn't how life works at all. I want you to notice that James does not say if we face hard times, but says whenever, which indicates to me that painful times and trials will come. And they will come more than once, unfortunately. Whenever in this context is not a fun word. Because it says that difficult seasons are a reality in this life that we live. Good times happen to all people. Bad times happen to all people. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, the Bible says he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Yet James tells us. To consider it joy in our lives when we face trials. Those words seem just a little bit off. Joy in trials? But the next few words help to clear it up. As he also tells us that it is because of those trials that you face that develops that very perseverance in us. Whenever is not a fun word in this passage because it says that difficult seasons are a reality. Whenever is also a continuing, ongoing, open-ended reference. Many of us are in a difficult season right now. Maybe your relationships and arguments are leading you to be someone you no longer recognize. Maybe your health is not good physically mentally or emotionally. Maybe a family member or a parent's health is not good and we lie awake at night worried about them. Maybe you're blessed to have a job, but there's someone on your job that is making your life incredibly hard. Maybe you have prayed about something and feel like prayers are not being heard. Maybe you listen to the news and you hear violence almost daily. People shooting one another for a mistaken address and a misplaced knock on the door. Somebody's shooting somebody for turning around in the wrong driveway. I heard one the other day, a father and daughter playing basketball outside the house. The ball rolled into the yard next door and they got shot. Them both. What is going on? If you turn on the news and you see insurrection, riots, extremism, division, the ever-present racism, escalating violent climate, suddenly you no longer recognize 
where our culture is headed. Maybe you're struggling with thoughts of depression and loneliness and feel like there's no one to talk to. Let me pause for a moment. In our culture, we don't like to talk about mental health. We need to stop making that a taboo subject. It is real, and we, that we struggle with it, and there's something about us that says, let's not talk about this. Mental health is as real as any other type of health. Nobody says, if your kidney is bothering you, or oh, just buck up, you'll be all right. Drink it up, you'll get through it, right? If any other part of your body is ill, you go get help. Why do we think that doesn't apply to mental health? Why do we shame people and make them feel some type of way when they need help? We need to learn better and we need to do better because many of us are struggling with depression and loneliness and you need to talk to someone. Each of these trials that we face may at some point in our lives, I know there's someone listening to this at this very moment who's in the midst of a struggle. Just as James chapter 1 tells us, in the words that James gives us in chapter 1, he keeps in mind that everything that Jesus taught is to frame our trials, our struggles, and our challenges with faith in mind. Knowing that the trial will eventually, what, strengthen your faith. There's a quote I read once that says, all of us are broken but many of us are stronger at the broken places. Years ago, they would tell you that if you broke a bone and the bone healed, that at the point of the break, after it heals, the bone is actually stronger. It's that idea that when you've been through something, it strengthens you. What doesn't break you will strengthen you. Amen? And that's the idea behind this passage that James is sharing with us. As a child of God, what I want you to bear in mind in the midst of every trial that you go through in your life is that you were built for this. Built to persevere. Built to have faith even when it doesn't make sense. Built to find a way to keep going. To keep on keeping on when others somehow cannot. Verse 4 tells us perseverance must be Finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking for anything. So in this passage, perseverance is a spiritual key. So let me give you five thoughts about persevering. Perseverance is not something that will happen in life by accident. People quit God all the time. People quit life all the time. Perseverance through faith is an active, intentional choice. You have to choose to be per to persevere in those circumstances that throw all of that drama into your life. Perseverance is a choice and an act of your will and your faith. Persevering in faith with God in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit is not only a choice and an act of the will, but it is also the humbleness to allow God to be God in the midst of circumstances that seem out of control and hurtful. How can you and I persevere in the midst of a trial? God is not allowing pain or anguish or hurt or doubt or illness or financial strain or lost because he doesn't care or is unaware of what is happening in our lives. God's plan and purpose is that through all things, you and I would become more like Jesus. We all know that we certainly don't start out holy. I can say amen. We certainly don't start off holy and being like Jesus. We still all make mistakes. No matter how mature you are as a believer, no matter how long you've been in the church, you can be a Christian for decades and still hurt somebody's feelings or make mistakes or fall into sin 
or deal with doubt. You can be a Christian for decades and still deal with financial issues or be blindsided by a medical diagnosis. It happens. But what we understand from James' word in chapter 1 is that God Almighty uses these awful things to complete our faith and make us more like him. We must persevere through whatever drama we are facing that will form us not into the best version of ourselves, but more like Jesus Christ. The goal is always to be more like Christ. So how can you and I persevere in the midst of a trial? How do we persevere in the midst of difficult times? Number one, you pray to persevere. I have personally found that one of the hardest things to do in the midst of a trial is often, always, the best thing to do. In the middle of a trial, you and I might find it difficult to pray. We find it difficult to pray because we maybe we blame God for what is going on. Or we, think it's all unfair, and he should have intervened already. Strong emotions can at times be an obstacle to prayer. Let me pause right there for a moment. One of the things that all of us have to be mindful about is to manage your emotions. See, society tells you if you feel like it, it's okay. And you hear sometimes people bragging and boasting about how they go off on folks. Right? Oh, you better look out for her now. She'll go off on them. Mature folks, folks who love God, don't give themselves away to their emotions and lose all thought and reason about what's going on. You're not justified because you're mad. That doesn't make it okay for you to say and do what you want to do. Some of us get upset and we just lean in. Oh, you done took me there now. And we often running, cussing, and everything else all up and down. As you grow in Christ, you should learn to manage your emotions. You at least ought to be mature enough to say, I need to pause. Now, don't get me wrong. Emotions, God blessed you with those. You have emotions, and some things just make you upset. But you got to be mature enough to walk away. Don't lean in. Don't just let it rip. You didn't mess up now. God is watching you. He expects you to grow and mature. When you get upset like that, whatever technique you're going to use, count to 10, some of us need to count to 100. Whatever you need to do, but you can't just give yourself into emotion because everybody who's lived more than a few minutes knows that I don't make good choices when I'm upset. I don't do good things when I'm upset. And if you're trying to live a godly life, if you're trying to be more like Christ, then you ought to mature enough to know that when I'm there, I need to back away. Don't talk to your spouse like that. Being mad doesn't make that okay. Don't talk to your children that way. Let me tell you something, parents. There's a difference between discipline and anger. I had to learn that as a parent. There's a difference. Sometimes you need to be disciplining your children to teach them a lesson, not to vent your anger. Now, I learned this from my father, who was not a member of the church, but had a really good temper. And he had four sons, and he did not spare the rod at all. But you know what my father had the wisdom to do? He would not whoop us when he was angry. Wouldn't do it. Because he knew himself well enough to go, I'm going to hurt that boy if I whoop him right now. <laughs> I remember one time, I did something pretty bad. I set the house on fire, but that's another story. <laughs> I had to wait three days on that whooping. Three days. My mother tell you, we were living in apartments. And I was playing with matches. And anyway, I won't tell you all the details. My dad was so angry, he didn't whoop me for three days. And I will also tell you, them three days was almost worse than the whooping. Yeah. Oh, the whooping was coming. I knew that. I wasn't getting out of the whooping. And every day I was coming home going, it's today today? (laughs) Oh, Lord. You know what I'm saying? The three days was almost worse. But he had enough wisdom to know how to manage that part of himself as a father. So parents, understand discipline and anger is not the same thing. 
Be careful. You have to discipline your children, even when it needs to be harsh, out of love. Be clear-minded. Because guess what? Our children know the difference. They know when you're disciplining them to teach them and when you're just mad. It's not the same thing. Amen? You have to learn to manage that because emotions can take you somewhere you don't need to be. We find it difficult to pray in the midst of trials, yet it is during those valley moments that you and I need to draw near to God in prayer. Drawing near to God in prayer allows us to persevere when we need to talk to him. We need to sometimes yell at him. We need to cry to him. We need to share our pain and joy and struggles with him. We need to share our hearts with God so that he can begin to align our hearts with him. You can tell it all to God. Wherever you are in that moment, God is right there with you. You can share it all with him. You've always got someone to go to. In every moment, in every situation, that is the end result of our prayer. Our hearts becoming more aligned with God's will. And he helped us to endure those valley experiences that we all face. Remember this. When you least feel like praying is when you most need to pray. Push through that. Push through that. Don't let Satan distract you with the drama. When you feel something pulling you away from God, lean in. Pray. Stop in that moment. Resist. The moment you don't feel like praying is the moment when you most need to. Recognize what that is and always lean in towards God. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse verse 18, the Bible says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 says, pray continually. Jude chapter 1 verse 20 says, dear friends, build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. In your toughest moments, never forget that as a child of God, you were built for this. Number two, active relationship with the Lord. Perseverance is an action word. Other words that mean the same as perseverance are also action words. Hold fast, persistence, determination, grit. Those are all action words. As we are seeking to persevere in all kinds of trials, we need to be active in our relationship with God. When I think about our relationship with the Lord, I think of the relationship like any other, even though God Almighty is not like any other. You and I need to talk to him, share with him, have an active relationship with him in ways that he has provided for us to connect with him. So what does an active relationship with him look like? Read scripture and think on it even when you don't feel like doing that. Now, all of us know, as you get older, the idea that I can only do what I feel like doing does not work. We have to push past that. You won't always feel like doing what God wants you to do. But it's childish. Only childish people think I can only do what I feel like doing. You don't use that logic in any other area of your life. You do what you have to do. The same thing works in your relationship with God. You have to do the things that you know you must do. Read scripture. Study on scripture. Pray even when you have doubts about God's and what he is doing while you're hurting. Stay in Bible study and be around other Christians even when your trial is going along, going on. Confide in Christian friends and let them listen to you and pray with you and encourage you. Everybody in your circle is not in your corner. Tell me who you hang around with and I will tell you who you're about to become. The people you surround yourself with alter how you think. They encourage or discourage you. They shape your habits and behaviors. Don't fool yourselves. Peer pressure is real. Peer pressure is real. They 
People around you either fill you with positive or negative emotions. If you're around folks who are negative all the time, what do you think is about to happen to you? And that goes for everybody. Everybody that has a significant time in your life makes you either better or worse, period. Everyone in your life either pushes you closer to God or further away. And spiritual maturity is recognizing that. You are fooling yourself if you think you can live a godly life surrounded by a bunch of folks who can't even spell God. The moment you get in struggle, they're not telling you to pray. They're not pushing you towards God. Sometimes you don't need an answer. You just need encouragement. Sometimes you just need somebody in your life to say, hold on. God is there. But if you surround yourself with folks who could care less about God. See, as we grow towards Christ, our habits and our choices are supposed to change. I get that all of us, well, many of us, I'll raise my hand. We're out there. Y'all know what I mean, right? But as your life grows closer to God, you have to have the spiritual maturity to realize I can't have everybody in my inner circle. You can't. And that doesn't mean you dislike people. It doesn't mean you're not friends with them. It doesn't mean y'all didn't grow up together and all like that. But if you live in that life, and I'm trying to live a Christian life, be real. It doesn't work. And you got to have enough maturity to go, I need to surround my folks who love God like I love God, who are running after God the way I'm trying to run after God, who are trying to lo- learn and grow in the Lord. This is difficult enough as it is. You surround yourself with folks who are not even thinking about God. You're making your journey that much harder. We have to be realistic with ourselves, and our choices have to reflect our faith. Everyone in your life is either a positive or a negative influence. And you need to look at the people around you. You need to look at the people around you and decide who is helping you to become more like God and who is pulling you away. So what does an active relationship with him look like? Stay connected to worship service even when you know you're in pain and going through a trial. You and I are made to have a relationship with God. And when life gets tough, we need to lean into God rather than pull away from him. The harder the road, the more we need God in the driver's seat of our life. Number three, know that it will get better. Hope is an amazing thing. Hope in God, right? A thought that can guide us when we are stretched in is that life will change and get better. There are seasons to life that do change. King Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 wisely says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. There are times when it is difficult to know it will get better in the midst of losing someone you love, feeling uprooted, feeling hurt, being torn down, feeling like giving up, feeling thrown away, enduring silence. It gets hard. But seasons do change. Hard times do give away to better ones. As long as you are breathing, as long as God is still on the throne, you have hope. You were built for this. Better days may not come when you want them or how you want them. The Israelites endured 40 years of wandering in the wilderness before they were ushered into the promised land. They had to wait 70 years in exile, away from home, before they could return and rebuild. Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days. Jesus had to wait 30 years to begin his ministry and to even begin to fulfill his purpose. Hold on to hope because God's got a plan to pull you through and his timing is perfect. Isaiah the prophet reminds us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are better than your thoughts. Number three, know it will all get better. Number four, know that it won't get better. Huh? What? Wait, 
wait, wait, Tony. You just said it will all get better. I said it will not get better. And now I'm telling you that it won't get better. Yep. I'm saying both. The larger reality of our lives is that we live in a fallen, broken, messed up, hostile world where sin abounds and sin breaks into everything. There's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There's sickness that comes to hurt, pain, and kill. There's selfishness that comes to wreck, isolate, and demean. There is disaster that comes to stress, destroy, and unbalance. James talks about trials of many kinds and testing that will come our way. This means we should come to expect this. Life will have its share of pain and frustration. No one's life is perfect, no matter how it looks on TV or social media. No one's perfect, no matter what they tell you. No one has perfection on this side of heaven. The old gospel hymn says, this world is not my home. I am just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Your ultimate comfort was never meant to be here. Despite what some would have you to believe, there is no heaven on earth. So instead of chasing an easy life, grow in the reality that things will never be fully right in this earth. But good news is, they will be in heaven. God has prepared a place for prepared people, a paradise just for you. All is not lost because in the midst of this fallen, busted up, janky world, janky's in a dictionary, you can look it up, we can hold fast to hope in the way Jesus taught us by praying to him, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Even in this life, there is still joy. There is still faith. There is still God. As a child of God, always know you were built for this. Number five, persevere with others. We should not try to navigate difficult seasons on our own. There are no healthy followers of Jesus Christ that are lone rangers. Going alone, you will be unnecessarily broken in ways that an encouraging, faith-filled, Jesus-following spiritual family can help you through. Facing contrary voices, doubts, and difficulties with others beside us allows us to grow and prosper in our faith and allows us to hold fast to hope. Our spiritual inner circle helps us to persevere when we face those trials. King Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. The apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Perseverance isn't found simply through some kind of of relief, but it is found when others walk with us through real stress, anxiety, hurt, and emotional trouble. Perseverance is found in community, in spiritual family. When you walk through valleys of life with folks who share your faith in God, it will bond you in ways that you cannot imagine. When you both love God, and you get through that thing with someone who also knows God, and God brings you out on the other side, it creates a spiritual bond that I can't really describe to you. And I pray that you have that blessing in your life if you don't already. Vernon and I are close for a reason. One, we love each other. But two, we've been through things together. That's why I know no matter what happens, no matter where I am, in any moment, I can pick up the phone and call him. I might not talk to Vernon since I don't know when. I'll pick up the phone and call him. When you go through things with people who share your faith and share your love, it changes your relationship in a positive spiritual way. And others who also believe in Jesus and can encourage us in our faith, they can encourage us to keep putting one faithful step in front of another. Church 
is important. Bible class is important. Developing deep relationship with other Christians is important. All of these are important spiritual ingredients for perseverance. As a child of God, you were built for this. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. James talks about trials coming to us in verse 2. He speaks about testing of our faith and perseverance being developed in verse 3. It is in verse 4 that James tells us about the end result of perseverance in our lives. The end result of perseverance in our lives is a mature and complete faith that lacks nothing. The truth is that trials of many kinds make us a better person in Christ when we allow God to mold us and shape us through our struggles. We come to understand God more fully. We internalize who Jesus Christ is to us when our world is collapsing. We draw comfort from the Holy Spirit when our hearts are in a hundred pieces. We come to understand the role of faith more after it has been tested. A person of faith who has been through trials is a person of faith with maturity to trust God more and more. Each experience grants us endurance and faith where we have a deeper level of trust in God. This is important in the Christian walks. James says that a person who can trust God without stopping, no matter the trial or test of any kind, will perfectly complete in faith. As a child of God, don't ever forget you were built for this. None of us, no matter how hard we try, will be anywhere close to perfect. All of us make mistakes. No matter how hard you persevere, you can't be perfect and you can't earn heaven no matter how much you do good works. Romans 6.23 says very clearly that we have all earned separation from God because of our sins. But we have the gift of salvation through what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ, in Jesus our Lord. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has made a way for us to have a relationship with God because we could never, ever earn it. Jesus persevered for us and died for us. Jesus persevered until death on the cross for you and me to forgive all of our sins, to be raised again on the third day and sit on the right hand of God. I know for all of us, life can be difficult sometimes. Drama is just a part of living. Just keep living long enough and all of us get our fair share. But know that you can persevere. Know that wherever you are in any moment, God is right there with you. If you are here this morning and you've been going through your own valley moment, if you are here this morning and you have been struggling to persevere and to maintain your faith, if you are here this morning and you are not yet a member of the Lord's church, the Bible says hear, believe, confess, repent, and be baptized. And we will pause everything we are doing this morning to bring you to baptism and to be added to the family of God. All of that, Jesus' death on the cross, has made available to you as we ask you to come forward as together we stand and sing. Oh, why do you linger wandering from the fold of Christmas? Thank you. Hear you not the invitation Oh, prepare to meet thy God, careless soul, while we thy warning for your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad 
to face the judgment. I'm prepared.